Okay. Okay. So maybe maybe I will slowly start, and it'll it'll give uh, the rest of the audience a little bit of time to to join in because it'll be okay. a moment. My lecture is long too. And I need to I need to to, to just pay the uh, depths to the, the the situation. I need to um, uh, give a little introduction, which I'm very okay. happy that we have you here. So maybe I'll 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 start by now. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, well. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm I'm incredibly happy and honored to to welcome uh, Warren Nidich today uh, with his lecture uh, Inter uh, Inter <laughs> Indeterminacy: Art and the Brain Without Organs. Uh, the lecture is is the fifth one from the series uh, of talks initiated by the Department of Painting and Drawing at the University of Arts in Poznan uh, with support of. Dr. Tomasz Halitko, the, the Dean of Painting um, uh, and the Faculty of Painting and Drawing. And uh, as I previously uh, mentioned, uh, the series of online lectures, uh, this particular series of all online lectures is dedicated to encounter with the critical thought of the most renowned contemporary theoreticians, art critics, curators and artists. At the time of the pandemic solitary confinement, we believe that with our effort, the forced physical distance can be reshaped into the advantage of the greater proximity in exchange of ideas. Uh, the uh, today lecture uh, the, is uh, the concentrated on, on the topic which uh, we already happen to be a little bit familiar with during our students' visit at uh, the, through the uh, thanks to the generosity of the of uh, Warren who welcomed us uh, a couple of years ago uh, uh, in his studio, uh, allowing to uh, to get closer to his uh, artistic practice. Um, I, uh, to those who who, have, who happen not to to be aware of the uh, importance of uh, uh, Warren as an artist, also as a theoretician, I, I allow myself to read a few words of introduction. Warren Nidich is a Los Angeles-based artist uh, whose international practice combines multidisciplinary and multimedia approach to create cross-pollinating conceptual text-based works that reflect upon uh, situations at the border zone of art, science and social justice. He had studied neuroscience, medicine and architecture. Selected awards uh, achieved include, uh, include Hauptstadt uh, Kulturfond uh, und Stiftung Kultur von Neustadt Kulturell Preises in 2020 in Berlin, the Catalog Forderung Prize in 2017 uh, in Berlin, Fulbright Scholar Program Award in 2013 and 11, uh, the McDowell Foundation Studio Grant in uh, 2011 and 99. The Willem Flusser Theory Award, Transmediale, the British Academy Fellowship in 2005, uh, ARCH, uh, uh, RB and AC Arts and Science Research Fellowship 2004, and Madrid Alberto Public uh, Sculpture Award in 2004. In 2021, he will exhibit at the Kunstmuseum Wolfsburg, uh, Haus der Kunst, Munich, Kunsthalle Nuremberg, and Zonspec. Quadriennial Arnheim, uh, the Netherlands. In 2019, his hanging neon sculpture, Pazagate Neon uh, 2018, uh, achieved, was on display at the Venice Biennale in 2019. Selected one person and group exhibitions include the Whitney Museum of American um, Art, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Walker Art Center, PS1 MoMA, MIT List Visual Art Center. House the Kultur and den Welt in Berlin, the Ludwig Museum Cologne, the ZKM Karlsruhe and the ICA in London. His projects have uh, appeared in an Art Forum, uh, the New York Times, uh, Art in America, Time uh, Out, Hyperallergic, Time Magazine, uh, Kunstform International, the New Yorker uh, and the New York Magazine and LA Times uh, besides others. He is a founder and director uh, of the Zasfe uh, Summer Institute of Art uh, and he has been a visiting lecturer at the Department uh, of Art at Goldsmiths College uh, London, 
Carnegie uh, Mellon, Brown University, uh, GSD, Howard University, Columbia University, Princeton University, Southern California Institute of Architecture, UCLA, uh, La Sorbonne in, 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 in La Sorbonne in Paris, University of Oxford, TU Deft School at Architecture, Architecture Association, Sci Arc uh, and Cambridge University. Uh, he is American editor of uh, archive books and author of over 20 books. His recent books include Glossary and the Cognitive Activism. Archive Books uh, Berlin uh, was re reviewed in the Los Angeles Review of Books and his first reader in uh, activist uh, uh, newer aesthetics is forthcoming in summer of 2021. And I'm also very happy uh, holder of uh, this book which you uh, edited and you also you, or you also put your wonderful text in which uh, has been uh, ever since very inspirational to me so uh, ladies and gentlemen please um, welcome warren nidich with his lecture to me uh, an eye opener an eye opener of the, the time that we live in and i think very much so important also for the painters the time that we are about to uh, to proceed so inter in the terminacy art and uh, the brain without organs welcome uh, warren nigel which we are all yours uh thank you very much let me um uh, let's see uh no 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 i want to present my presentation your entire screen and then i do this one Okay. Okay. Does every uh, I, you should maybe just see what says indeterminacy in the brain without organs? Does everyone see that? Is everyone? Am I cool? Is everything good? No, not now. Let's try again. No. Huh. Okay. That's weird. Okay. Sorry about that. It worked perfectly when we were uh, trying. Oh, I see. I get it. Um, let's see. I'm trying to share. Oh, here it is. I have to. Okay. Now it should work. Hold on. Okay. Now, how's that? That's it. Yes. We, we have it. Oh, we have it. Super. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing that we have this technology in these trying times. And uh, today I'm speaking to you from New York. And oh, uh, I'm sorry because we still don't see your uh, presentation. Pardon we me? We, we still uh, don't see your presentation. You don't see my presentation now? Yes, yes. Please try I, I can see the first page, Pavel. I can see the first page. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You see, now yes. you see the second page, third page. You see that, right? Yes, we, 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 we see it perfectly well at the okay. moment. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a big honor to be here. I really enjoyed meeting you, the different groups that have come through my studio in Berlin. It was very exciting uh, discussions we had, and um, you, you, you all are just fantastic. And you know, I think we shared a lot of love, a lot of love between each other. And uh, I mean, that, that's what art is. For me, art is about communication, uh, talking about art, meeting fabulous, uh, like-minded people, uh, and uh, sharing love. And so I hope to share some of my love with you today of my, of my subject matter. And I know that some of the work that I'm gonna be showing, you have to understand that I look at these PowerPoint uh, presentations as a form of artwork. It's just another medium. It's another platform. It's another way of staging. And, uh, and, and, and the PowerPoint, and also, I also kind of look at philosophy that way also. I'm looking at art and philosophy in a, very, in, in a way that I think um, is very healthy for artists. And that is, my, my relationship to philosophy is that art de defunctions and, and makes strange the environment and the cultural milieu that requires philosophy to, to, um, to reestablish itself, to renegotiate its terms. That philosophy, that art is, comes before philosophy, basically. And that's the key. Philosophy, I, I, I understand that many artists are reading philosophy and they are making artworks 
based on what they're reading. And there's a lot to be said for that. A lot to be said for that. But sometimes I find that the work becomes a little stale. And I believe in the power of art. So I just wanted to say that a lot of the stuff that I'm going to give you today is, is like an artwork. For instance, the brain without organs is my own term. Uh, the body without organs, of course, is Deleuze, but the brain without organs is my own, my own term. Many of the terminology, the ideas in this, in this philosophical uh, work that I'm giving you today through PowerPoint is an artwork. And I, I really want you to understand it that way. Now, I know that I'm speaking a lot about science and a lot of the science I'm talking about is very uh, detailed. And I don't expect that you know everything and understand everything. And when I come to something that's really super important, that I want you to really take home with you, uh, I'll, I'll say that. But the other slides that I'm giving you is, is it could be helpful so, for, some other, for some of you out there that have more of a science background. So I'm trying to talk to artists, cultural theorists, um, media artists, uh, you know, uh, interdisciplinary artists, you know, so it's, it's a lot of people to talk to, so I'm trying my best. So anyway, here we go. Uh, and also it's going to go about an hour and a half, and I also am going to read from my slides. I find that's a lot easier for people to understand than reading from a paper. You can go along with me. So anyway, and I'll try to go slow. If I'm going too fast, let me know. Okay, indeterminacy and the brain without organs. As Gilles Deleuze writes in Cinema 2, the time image, creating new circuits in art, means creating new circuits in the brain. And how about indeterminacy, the other terminology that we've been talking about? From the Cambridge Dictionary, the state of not being measured, counted, or clearly known. Describing indeterminacy, the composer John Cage said, my intention is to let things be themselves. Cage initially defined indeterminacy as the ability of a piece to be performed in substantially different ways. It's slippery. Brian Sims thus conflates indeterminacy with what Cage called chance composition when he claims that any part of a musical work is indeterminate if it is chosen by chance or if its performance is not precisely specified. The former case is called indeterminacy. The latter is called indeterminacy of performance. The body without organs. The body without organs. It was the French dramatist Antonin Artaud who discovered and named the body without organs. The body is the body. It stands alone. It has no need of organs. The body is never in organisms. Organisms are the enemies of the body. What is the, uh, the brain without organs? It is the body that is totally unfixed, like a teratoma or a body of heterodoxy. I'm gonna show you a picture of a teratoma and a body of heterodoxy is like, um, it, 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 hetero means different, constantly changing. Uh, heterodoxy is, is related to uh, theory, uh, different kinds of theories to describe something at variance with the official doctrine. And uh, it is a body in which the organization of its organs from its intimate cellular structure to its relationship with other organs to its relationship to the entire organism are free from the despotism of the body's overall plan. In other words, it's free of the rules and regulations of the specific a priori program situated in the DNA code. And this is a teratoma. Now what a teratoma is, is this ugly, horrible thing that we're seeing here that has aspects of hair in it on the top right. It has blood vessels. You can see in the middle, there's some blood vessels. There's some mesenchymal tissue. It's, it's muscle. There's some muscle tissue here in the bottom, over here on the bottom right. So what happens is why he used the word teratoma, why Deleuze wrote that idea of teratoma, was in what's called the gastrula, which is a G-A-S-T-R-U-L-A, -A, which is a uh, developmental stage in the embryo of the human being. What happens is there's a differentiation into different layers of, uh, of, of this. Now, normally, those layers stay separate. 
So they're called the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. And the endoderm, uh, the ectoderm becomes the skin. It's ecto, ecto, outside, becomes the skin and the brain. The mesoderm, middle, becomes things like muscles and things like that. And endoderm becomes the gut and the parasympathetic system. Normally, these layers are separate and they go along a very typical pattern to develop the, the embryo. But sometimes they go wrong. And sometimes these, these different layers come together. That's why he's talking about the brain, the body without organs as a teratoma. But he is really specifically talking about the body without organs as a, as a, in relationship to labor and relationship, especially to Fortis labor. And I'm going to get into that. And here is an example from Francis Bacon, Three Studies for Figure at the Base of a Crucifixion, 1962. And of course, Deleuze wrote extensively about Francis Bacon, and for this very reason. And this is a kind of another type of body without organs. It's a kind of social body without organs, right? The body is just not in the body. The body is a social body. It's a social organism. And in this case, you have multiple piercings where individuals have pierced themselves, which forms a star. I don't know if you can see the star, the, the formation of the star. Can you all see that? I, I can see it very easily. There's, the strings are forming a star. So by their total piercing, they're creating this morphology, this object. But it's, it's, through, it's through this body without organs, a body that isn't just stops at the, at the skin, but it's a body without organs that, that extends into uh, experimental artistic labor. So cognitive capitalism. So uh, cognitive capitalism. So here are some of the books that um, Dominic uh, mentioned, Psychopathologies of Cognitive Capitalism, part one, part two, and part three, which I've had the honor of editing. The brain, and so what is cognitive capitalism? How is it different from Fordism and post-Fordism? Uh, it, it shares a lot with actually post-Fordism. Early cognitive capitalism and post-Fordism are very, very connected. But anyway, the, the key of cognitive capitalism is that the brain and the mind are the new factories of the 21st century. We no longer labor on assembly lines. Of course we do. And when I say we no longer, I mean it's not the predominant form of labor. Of course, we're still doing agriculture, primary labor. And secondary labor, industrial labor is taking place in many parts of the world. Car, the production of cars and objects and things. But, uh, but, the, new, but the new and predominant form of labor, the Googles and the Microsofts and the Amazons and uh, the Zooms, <laughs> the Zoom that we're using, is a new kind of uh, immaterial labor. Uh, that in which the, the mind and the brain are the new factories of the 21st century. And we no longer labor on assembly lines, as I mentioned that already, making objects like automobiles, but rather perform immaterial, effective, intellectual labor on such social media websites, such as Instagram and Facebook, while all the time creating customized data from our searches uh, uh, on uh, engines like Google. The transition to what I have referred to as a neural-based economy from a knowledge-based economy has provided capitalism, now neural capitalism, with new marketplaces and opportunity for commoditization. And I'm gonna talk about neural-based economies uh, somewhat in this lecture. So here's the early, you know all of this, you've heard it in one, one way or another, Precarity, how many artists are doing work about precarity, precariousness? The whole uh, last uh, Venice Biennale was just full of, uh, of, of those kinds of uh, artworks. Um, the 24-7 real subsumption, the idea that everything we do is work now. We're on our iPhones at a party and we're checking uh, friends' uh, um, uh, likes and dislikes on Facebook or Instagram. Valorization, we've, we're no longer in a value economy. We're more into a valor. We're looking for valorized objects in things that other people like, uh, uh, things that are uh, gain uh, gain uh, monetary value through uh, being connected to a famous basketball player. Uh, the financialization of capital, in which uh, herd behavior has become an important, you know, the the stock market isn't really based on anything. It's based on mood. It's based on herd behavior. Immaterial labor, labor is performance 
oriented. It doesn't leave a trace uh, in communicative capitalism. That's kind of related to immaterial labor and valorization because things like, um, uh, you know, things like uh, advertising and public relations have become super important. In the art world, we can think of famous curator, uh, co uh, collectors or curators at the VIP lounge uh, telling uh, the international art community about their art, the, the works that they bought. And then all of a sudden, a young artist is supposedly um, discovered by a famous collector, and all of a sudden, everybody runs out of the VIP lounge <laughs> to where they are, um, to where that artist is showing or whatever, and the prices go skyrocketing. That's communicative capitalism, that's valorization, that's even financialization, and that's kind of an immaterial labor. And then the late cognitive capitalism, which is what I'm interested in. Neuropower replaces biopower. I'm not getting into all of this today because I would it would be three hour lecture. It's gonna be long too long already. Uh, but neuropower, uh, you know, bodies are replaced by brains, populations of bodies and uh, replaced by populations of brains, and the idea. Of, uh, of improvement, of not no longer about biopower being the, you know, the ability of a sovereign to take someone's life, but the idea of uh, a society in which uh, the, the brains and populations of brains are co-opted and normalized and, and organized in such a way that they, that they are so-called so improved. Hebanism, I'm not going to talk about that, replaces terrorism co-evolutionary frontalization, Rostel March, I'm not talking about that, although our society has become more frontal cortex than, than uh, the, the posterior cortex. In other words, we, we're defend, depending on things like the attention economy, which is the frontal lobe. We're uh, very involved in affect. Uh, we're involved in, in, um, in uh, you know, that kind of thing, whereas the, in the past it's been the sensory uh, it's more about the sensory organs of the brain, the visual cortex, the auditory cortex, and so forth, so on. I'm not getting into that. I can give you another lecture another time on all of this. And the commoditization of the neural common by neural capitalism. So the neuroplasticity of the brain, which is the neural common, is being commoditized and normalized by neural capitalism. Again, I'm not talking about that either today, but just to be uh, complete, I wanted to mention these things. Okay, the body without organs undermined and resisted the tyranny of the assembly line in Fortis factories by distributing bodies, uh, uh, by disrupting the body's continuity with it, as well as the management regulations imposed by Taylorism, thus unsettling the flow of labor in the production of surplus value. The situated body agency was put in parallel. So if you think about that, just think about that horrible image uh, of the teratoma, and the disruption of the normal way that the body is configured. And you think of, of um, piercings, and you think about um, even the, the, the product, today's uh, interest in changing uh, one's sexuality by taking hormones uh, to discover their real true self. That, that kind of is a kind of, that's the body without organs. It's, and it disrupts uh, the continuity between how an assembly line, for instance, or and all the metaphors of an assembly line, or the metaphor of Taylorism, in which here the laborer is 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 being taught or being photographed in a way to see how to uh, to hit the hammer in such a way that it's the most efficient, loses the less energy, is done in the most rapid time, because when they get on the assembly line, which is on the right. They have these very abstract, um, uh, abstract uh, things to do. As the object comes down the assembly line, their labor has been reduced to a very abstract movement, a very abstract movement. And that abstract movement allows uh, each, each of the uh, members uh, of the labor force to, um, to uh, intercede if someone else gets sick or they can exchange and change jobs because the jobs are not really that different from each other. And they can be learned very, very quickly. That kind of efficient, and, and also each of the laboring stations is maximized for their efficiency. So you get a, a quicker, uh, a more uh, in, uh, increase in the flow of labor. You produce more in a certain amount of time and the surplus value, that value between uh, the, what you have to pay a laborer and what you can uh, sell a commodity for, that is 
um, extended. And you all know about this. I mean, you guys know more about this than I do, I'm sure. And, but uh, we're no longer proletariats working on the assembly line. We're cognitaries. The kind of labor that we're doing is, is very, very different. We're using our minds and our brains. You don't see anybody sledge, slamming a hammer here. What you see is eye movements. You see attention. You see maybe the fingers. Uh, you know, there's kind of the, the iPhone is ergonomic in the sense of it, it, it fits well into the hand. It's at the right uh, size so that you can see it easily. You can, you can manipulate it. In cognitive capitalism, the body without organs is no longer an adequate disruptor of laboring styles, and thus a new form of dissensus is required. Remember, we are all cognitariates or digital laborers in which, remember, we are all cognitariates or digital laborers in which life itself is work. In the future, new forms of technology, like the wired brain in which brain-computer interfaces will hook up the brain electrical activity to the internet and virtual reality will further complicate this situation. It will be the unconscious and conscious thoughts of the digital laborer that will be directly generate the data used by big data and the big other, as Shoshona Zuboff says. Real subsumption will be dominated now by neural subsumption. Everything we think, consciously and unconsciously, will be work. Just as the body without organs derailed the fixed capital and surplus protection, production of the Fortis assembly line, I am suggesting that the brain without organs will deregulate different forms of existing and future fixed labor, now the intracranial, extracranial brain, in late stage or neural cognitive capitalism. So here's an, uh, an example. Unfortunately, you can't see the whole thing. For some reason, when I put it in, it didn't the whole thing. This is a work that I'm doing in Berlin. It opens uh, November, uh, December, um, excuse me, May 1st in a show called Activist Neuroaesthetics, The Brain Without Organs. And here, I don't know why, but you, let me see. It says I can do this. I hope I can do this. Anyway, you see on the bottom, this is the Parthenon marbles. In the, in the real piece, you see the whole Parthenon marbles. But the Parthenon marbles, were uh, taken from Greece in the 1850s by Lord Elgin, and they sit today in the British Museum. And they are an important, uh, a, an important designator uh, of the Enlightenment. They are they become the, the this kind of sculpture from the classic Greek period uh, finds itself as a very important part of what we call uh, what we consider uh, what the human being is, and 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 the rights of man, and all these things are are captured in these sculptures and what I, and on the very top which you can also see is it says the singularity so what i'm trying to do in this ex, in this piece is to understand uh, what new kinds of um of, of consciousness and what kind of um machine consciousness uh, how we can uh, you know what how we can enlighten the uh, this new kind of future consciousness and in this case what's happening and again you can't see everything but on the very bottom in the in the parthenon marbles you see these colored hands a green one a red a purple one you can see the very top of a, a, of an orange one and then you notice that the orange and the, and the and the purple they have a dotted lines this is a whole neon by the way this is a neon sculpture and it goes all the way to the top to various ais and then the ais come together so what i'm arguing here is I want an enlightenment based on otherness, altierity, uh, um, queer, queerness, um, uh, you know, uh, global, uh, uh, that the enlightenment isn't any longer Eurocentric, it's no longer um, phallocentric, um, uh, you know, it, it's now, it, it, the ideas of the enlightenment uh, are now expanded uh, to, uh, to a global concept and incorporate all kind, all peoples and all sexes. And you know, people, and I know there's some people in the audience who might feel that um, this is um, not critical enough, that the Enlightenment was responsible for the Holocaust, for instance, or for the decimation of Native American populations, or for colonialism in, uh, and, and, you know, and the whole idea of Christianity and, the, and, and, and how Christian and Christianity and Catholicism was used to um, normalize uh, these, for instance, uh, the cultures of 
of, of the of the South Americans, the Incas and the Aztecs, and also the 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 the, uh, the guilt of the Catholic Church in the Holocaust. I, I understand that. I'm very, very aware of that. But without the Enlightenment, we have Donald Trump. Okay, that's why I did this piece. This piece is really a reaction to Donald Trump. Without this, without trying to find a way, and it's not easy to find a way. To, it's not easy to forget uh, the past. It's not easy if, to to blame. It's very easy to. And I know that, um, you know, I know that, you know, in my own little way, I'm trying to find a way. Um, and, and this is a much more complicated, this, I could talk about this sculpture for two hours and to understand why, because what it is, just to say one more thing, it's an artificial neural network. The Parthenon marbles are the input layer, the, set, the middle layer is the hidden layer, where all the, um, where all the different kinds of, um, of, uh, of uh, weights and, and, val and valences from the repeated stimulation that's coming from the Parthenon marbles, but then has to be um, uh, kind of, um, uh, what am I saying? It kind of, uh, uh, it meets with this information coming from the, uh, from the phantom limbs and together they create uh, the network that then informs the artificial intelligence and the singularity. So that was what I was trying to do. But it's 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 you know it's a complicated piece. But it's we'll come back to this piece when I talk about neural networks in the brain, because neural networks are the basis of artificial neural networks. So anyway, the brain without organs is such a form of deregulation and disturbance. I want to speak about the brain without organs the B, now I'm say BRWO, an entity that is indeterminate and malleable. And that's the indeterminate word is how I'm going to relate to the indeterminacy of uh, Fluxus and Cage and Duchamp and all of this. The brain without organs is an indeterminate organ and neuroplasticity is its agency. One can also say that our neuroplastic potential is a form of common currently under assault by neoliberalist politics and its apparatuses private and corporate ownership. And this relation of the indeterminate and how it transforms the material brain will form the core of this lecture. I want to understand this as a power of artistic production. To do this, we will need to take advantage of a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary intersectional and activist approach. What does brain mean in terms of brain without organs? I want to suggest an indeterminate conceptual framework of the brain, one that is not planned. I want to use aleatory music and chants to make my point. The brain is not a crystallized structure, but a fluid and becoming entity. The expanded view, that's what I call the expanded view versus the limited view. The limited view is that the brain is inside the bony um, carapace of the skull, the expanded view is that the brain is, yes, it's the material brain in the skull, but it's also the situated body, the situated nervous system, um, and also it's, it's the changing extracranial brain, which is based on the sociological, technological, um, artistic, aesthetic uh, changes that are taking place, uh, the acceleration of technology. It's, it, the expanded view is a very Stieglerian view, and uh, Bernard Stiegler's idea of epiphylogenesis and exteriorization are very important here. I'm not going into that, unfortunately. Um, but again, I have, uh, there's a few papers that just came out about my relationship to Stiegler and also to uh, Jean Baudrillard and how I talk about simulation, three levels of simulation in, in relationship to epiphylogenesis. But again, I'm sorry, I can't go into that now. But here we are in this idea of the of this kind of uh, extended view of the brain. And I mean by an extended embodied emerging one, which is coupled to an evolving sociocultural technological environment in which mindedness is its agency. I want to suggest an intracranial, extracranial situated complex. So when I'm talking about the brain without organs, I'm not just talking about the intracranial brain. I'm talking about the extended view. I'm talking about the situated body and I'm talking about the extracranial brain. So in the intracranial brain, you have the neuropharmacology, neural sent, neuro, neuroceutics, brain computer inter interfaces, psychedelics. Uh, and psychedelics are very obviously can affect the brain without organs because it changes, uh, you know, through the neurochemical uh, relations, it changes the way that the circuits of the brain are organized and also changes the way 
that you see, you know, you see hallucinations and you're, 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 you're seeing things in the extracranial brain that, that are trans uh, changing. And then of course, on the bottom of it, you have the trans biome, the microbiome. The, there's a kind of a brain that exists in the stomach. It actually produces different kinds of kinins that uh, circulate throughout the body and affect the mood of the brain. Depression is one of the examples of how the stomach can affect the, the brain. Uh, this, and then also how your eyes are situated, the fact that your eyes are situated at four degrees from each other at an angle, allow you to have depth perception, you know, all these kinds of things. Uh, then there's the extracranial uh, brain, which today is post-anthropocentric, uh, post-humanistic, post-operismo, it's accelerated technology, data, fake news, attention economy. All these things are um, affecting uh, through, the, the, through the neuroplasticity and epiphylogenesis and epigenesis, uh, this intracranial brain. I want to speak about the brain without organs, an entity that is indeterminate and malleable. The brain without organs is a, in a constant state of becoming, and its power is the brain's pluripotentiality. The famous neuroscientist Oliver Sporns puts it, the indeterminacy of information content of world objects and events is matched by the structural variability of the animal nervous system at many levels. The structural variability is connected to the variability of the cultural habitus. So the relationship of the material variability to the cultural variability and how art affects the cultural variability is what we're trying to talk about here. This variation occurs at many levels in the nervous system, including the number of synapses, their forms, the number of neurons, the patterns of neurochemical distribution, the sequence of events at the growing tip of growth cones, that's a neurodevelopmental term, and the consequent variation of the structure due to learning. What produces this indeterminacy in the world that, that he speaks of? I want to focus on artistic practices that engage with indeterminacy as a doorway of art power in general. I want to link the implications of Sporn's quote by understanding the immaterial and material consequences of works of experimental art and the avant-garde in the architecture of the brain in the world. Let's step back for a moment and review some basic concepts in the, in the field of art and neurobiology. Remapping and deterritorializing, remapping and deterritorializing the material brain. So here, as I said, I want to give you a little bit of a backdrop about things so that we can understand, so that, you know, some of you who haven't had the science, um, you know, can be on board a little bit more. And um, I apologize for, for, to those who feel this is uh, very obvious, but here we go. So here's a neuron, here's one neuron. And I, I kind of think about, it kind of looks like a dancer uh, you know, dancing with on two legs with on one, uh, you know, ballet slippers on to on point and the other leg is kind of behind it and then it goes up and there's the head and the arm, the hair is tousled and the arms are above the head making all kinds of gesticulations. But here we have the neuron and here we have a number of components. These are called the dendrites and they are coming in from everywhere for, with messages from other neurons that create incredible networks. Then we have what's called the nucleus. This is the soma of, of the neuron, the, the cell body or the soma. This is full of different kinds of components. This is the nucleus where all the DNA is. And then there's th through, um, through this uh, what's called messenger RNA. We, we know about RNA now because of uh, you know, the, new, the new viruses, the new um, vaccines are RNA viruses versus DNA viruses. So you know a little bit more now what a DNA is and what an RNA is. So the RNA, there's something called messenger RNA and it replicates, the DNA splits and the messenger RNA comes and replicates it. And then it, 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 it's smaller so it can get through the nucleus into the cell body. And there it, it, um, it coordinates rhizomes to um, make proteins. And those proteins are neurochemicals. And those neurochemicals flow down the axon. This is called the axon hillock. And they, that's where the axon actually uh, meets the, uh, meets the, nucle meets the, um, uh, the cell body of the neuron. And then these, there's, a, there's a flow of chemicals down uh, because of these microtubules and neural filaments. And they, the, finally, the, uh, the chemicals get to the presynaptic vesicles and presynaptic membrane, which is at the very, very tip here. 
okay. And then here's like two of these neurons now together. And here again, here we the previous neuron, which are the dendrites, they form synapses, which I'm gonna show you in a second where the chemicals are released. It's, it's the summation of all these different other neurons and, the, and their relationship and the synapsing on the cell body through, the, uh, through these, its appendages, its, a, its a dendritic appendages, and the summation of all that, if it's the right, if the amount of excitation and inhibition are at the right uh, level, an action potential or an electrical signal is transmitted from one neuron to another. And that's called an action potential. Why I'm showing you all this neurophysiology is not that I expect you to really know what a depolarization or why and how the sodium and potassium ions change and all of that and the gated channels and all that. But I just want you to know that it, about the action potential, it's an all or none uh, kind of thing. All of a sudden, the, the, uh, the ionic uh, intracellular inter inter uh, and extracellular space which is, this is the extracellular space, this is the intracellular space. At one particular point, there's the, 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 the charge between these two is such that uh, this reaction occurs, which is called a depolarization. Okay, fine, that's all. And then here I wanted to just show you, these are different neurons coming and uh, all together summating, uh, and a, here's a positive one called an ex, um, excitatory postsynaptic potential. Um, and here is an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And it's the summation of all these, these different uh, other neurons as they interact with, this, uh, um, with the neurons uh, uh, cell body that in the end will cause what, uh, the, the, this action potential. Okay, so that's just something. And then here's that synapse. These are the microtubules I was talking about transmitting the, the neuropharmacological uh, agents. And here are the spherules, spherules that, that contain the transmitter. And then here is the, the spherule as its membrane. It has a membrane. It, 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 it um, combines with the membrane of the presynaptic terminal. And together it, it releases its neurochemicals into the synapse where those synapse, uh, where those chemicals then interact with these receptors, which are like gates, and they uh, allow uh, the neurochemical to create a kind of uh, avalanche or uh, waterfall of, uh, of different chemical reactions. And then I wanted to just show you this because it's kind of important for the next slide. And this is three different diagrams. Here you see the first it's a, this is a stimulation, something like an experimental paradigm in which uh, the neuron is stimulated in, in, in only one frequency, it goes boop, and that's it. And then it causes this reaction of voltage. And over time, it's a little hump, not a big hump, but a little hump. And then what's called a tetanus, uh, a repeated stimulation is given to that same uh, neural network and boop, 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 boop. And that causes uh, uh, this, this voltage reaction of, of, of action potentials. And then the next time, this is what learning is, next time the original stimulation, the original singular stimulation now, because the neuron remembers, because changes have taken place at the synaptic level, that same just little blip causes now a big hump and a big action potential. And that's key. Uh, and, and here you understand why because when, when the, the synapses learn, they have, in this case, more uh, neurochemical spherules being released into the synaptic uh, channel. But they also uh, have a, very, a, a, a changing receptor gates. And uh, now, in this case, these AMPA receptors, and again, you don't have to remember it, just remember that something happens to the synapse that all of a sudden makes it more permeable and makes it more active and makes it more intense and strong. Because this is why, this is a key, this is the key, um, why I've given you all of that information. This is the key slide. And this is uh, from Levey and Stryker, and this is taken from the, uh, uh, of, of, of a kitten at 17 days old and uh, as an adult kitten. And basically, what's that, what this is showing is, just to give you a little bit uh, to get you oriented, this is in the back of the brain. So if you touch the back of your skull 
right underneath the back of your skull is called the occipital lobe. And the occipital lobe is, is important for, uh, for vision. And it has, like every, all the cortex, the, 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 the top layer that surrounds the brain, this is what's called the cerebral cortex, is six layered everywhere. It's like a cap. You know how you wear a woolen cap in the winter because it's cold? That little thing, sometimes it's thick, sometimes it's thick. Well, anyway, that woolen cap is, you can imagine that woolen cap covering your whole skull as the way that the cerebral cortex covers the whole brain. And it's six, always six layers, but the kinds of cells and, and the kinds of um, connections it has and it makes determine what it does. And in this case, again, here's your six layers. Here's layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five, and layer six. And lo and behold, in the 17-day-old cat, we see this matrix, this uh, rhizomatic, um, very, very dis uh, anarchic, uh, but heavily populated neural network made up of all those neurons that we saw in the previous slides. We saw all those neurons in the previous slide, and they're together, but they don't have any order. They haven't been ordered. They're a result of a, a at 17 day old, the genes in, in the cells, the chromosomes, I should say, uh, are turning on certain um, mechanisms for the production of proteins that create these, these, uh, these neurons. But there isn't any, it's, it's, a, it's, it's in the genetic code, but the code, doesn't have any real order to it. And it relates to all of the ancestors of the cat, all the visual systems of the cat, some of them which have been put to sleep, uh, and some of them which have been uh, uh, you know, enlightened, some of them that have, been we uh, that have been put to sleep in the development of the cat, uh, because the cat has certain needs. It, and, and those visual needs are things like recognizing certain facial gesticulations of another cat that may be angry at them, L looking for the right kinds of uh, colors of the mice or the uh, or or, or anim mammals that it might need to eat, um, looking for different kinds of shelter that it might might need to know. All of these things have uh, gone and evolved uh, over time, and they're all the different cat species all the kinds of experiments in vision uh, that have occurred are represented here. And then what happens is, and this is why I showed you all those slides, this is what neuroplasticity is, this is what makes neuroplasticity the word it is, is that the neurons, there's something called neuroplasticity in which the, it, this, the adult cat, as, it, as it, it, it interacts with the environment, as it learns, how to hunt as it learns about how to mate and how to play and how to recognize this and that, learns it from its mother or, you know, and interacts with the environment. What happens is, is that it, those neurons that, and in the neural network on the left, that are, are, are most synced with those capacities and those uh, abilities, that are most synced with those kinds of things that, that the visual system needs to know, they will be accentuated. They will be selected for, like natural selection. They will be selected for. Uh, whereas those that are not so stimulated, because don't forget, the currency of the nervous system is stimulation. Just uh, when, you're the, when the brain is being stimulated, when the nervous system is being stimulated, uh, things happen. And in this case, Two processes, are, two processes are occurring. On one hand, certain of the neurons are becoming stronger. They're becoming more efficient. They're being selected for. And on the other hand, there are other neurons in this, in this matrix, this rhizomatic, anarchic, uh, hedgy looking thing that are not being stimulated. And they go and they die off. So what is left in the adult cat, and you see this as is a very ordered, organized, and very, very highly specified um, organ for, for vision of a specific cat umwelt, the specific world of the cat, the necessary things that the cat needs to see, the visual umwelt, the conspecific visual umwelt of the cat, the cat's world, is now materialized in a morphology and a structure of this neural network. Now, another thing that's happening, is those that have managed to be selected for 
are now interacting with each other and all kinds of emergent phenomena take place things that are be you know were never uh, you know are greater than the sum of their parts things that that happened uh, as a result uh, of them being in proximity together so we understand that this material brain is a result of an epigenetic phenomena uh, in which the 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 cat's world the cat's umwelt the conspecific umwelt of the cat is sculpting the uh, the neural plasticity of the brain and what we'll see in human beings is that human beings take it one step further and they are then changing their environment human beings are 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 building buildings making art creating urban structures um, creating new kinds of forms of of, of, of aesthetic production you know um, you know how different is uh, Russian constructivism to uh, uh, to forms of pop culture or to abstract expressionism we will see a little bit of that in in the next slides but the fact of the matter is is that the this is an indeterminate structure and it's in human beings especially it's awaiting to find itself it can it can it's malleable and it can change depending on what's out there that's going to stimulate it that's going to select for those neurons over other neurons it's it, and uh, and allow this kind of emerging uh living living material to to occur anybody have a question out there i can't see anybody does anybody have a question so far Does, am I going too fast? Hello? Hello? It seems Hi. to be a good rhythm, Warren. It's good? It's good? Yes, we all, we all following. <laughs> Great. You're all following. Fantastic. Yeah. This is the hardest as, part. As long as our neurons uh, allow us. <laughs> okay. Super. <laughs> and there's no questions. Everybody's cool. Okay. Let's go on. So just, just like here, we had this very anarchic looking neural network on the left in the immature brain on the right we have the structured brain i thought this was an interesting um thing to show you which is topiary in which here we have a hedge which is like uh, the neural network on the left it's anarchic it hasn't been cut it hasn't been sculpted it's just growing wild. It's a, it's growing wild uh, according to its own its own um, genetic um, code. And here we have this beautifully sculpted hedge, and this is called topiary. And I hope that gives you an idea about what I was talking about in the brain. And here we have this other thing. Of course, we've all been, you know, we've all heard the whole, we all know distributions of the sensible and we redistribution of the sensible. And Ranc what Ranciere proposes that our sensible environments are designed to create homogenous experiences that organize and police our free will. And the distribution of the sensible determines how, who has the power of doing and ways of seeing, which determine who has the power to name the sayable, the thinkable, and the possible. And these networks of distribution. But, uh, and the redistribution is this way that artists have a voice in all of this and they, they redistribute the sensible. Uh, and I'm also arguing, if you just understood what I was talking about, that this distribution of the sensible has implications for the extended material brain. So that that's where uh, this relationship of art also comes in. And the idea of policing, the policing the sensible is also about policing the thought, thoughtful, the thinking, the brain, because those neural networks in the brain are in are in uh, are entangled with those distributions as they exist in the world. So here we have an example of Corbusier, the uh, radi radiant city, in a very 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 specific kind of architecture, a very kind of very specific kind of urban space, a very planned urban space, and one can imagine the kind of brain one might have walking the, the, uh, the coordinated, um, uh, e um, uh, you know, coordinated uh, Euclidean geometry of this, this city, as opposed to uh, the naked city of, uh, of Guigi de Borde um, and the Situationists, 
in which a very different kind of, of, uh, of, of relationship to the city and its, its effect on uh, how our, our brains and how our mappings of, in the brain may occur. And this is an example, very uh, an extent, another uh, example from uh, neuroscience in which uh, these are, are um, these are looking at uh, scans, different kinds of scans, and what's happening is that the these people are, who are these scans are this represents one person, a second person, another person, another. These are um, uh, you know seven different people. These seven different people are looking at the same stimulus. They're doing the same thing, and yet their brains are responding to that stimulus in very, very different ways. And, and that's the variation of the nervous system. It's like two twins, two exact twins, will have very, very different brains. And let's look uh, how this might, have a, um, might affect um, let's look at it, how it might af af affect us in a, in a much larger way. And that's look at, let's look at a little bit, I don't want to go too much into accelerated technologies and, and, uh, and the internet and the world wide, world wide web and all of the worlds that we're in right now. But let's look at some ontogenies of models of the brain uh, from the modular to the network brain, just to show you. So here is this, um, uh, these are different kinds of, of uh, models of the brain. And in, in, I wanna keep our attention uh, here. Of course, this is the 19th century, the idea that the bumps on the head would be re would, were somehow related to uh, different kinds of uh, personality traits. But when we move, that becomes later on, uh, it becomes the this idea of the modular part of the brain, that the brain is, is, is divided into modules and these modules have very different um, capacities. And like I mentioned, the visual cortex, yes, there is a visual cortex. Uh, there is a, you know, a auditory cortex, there is a frontal cortex, parietal cortex, they have, they have in a way, different, different uh, abilities. And the, insist the insistence, it's kind of, these models are really a product of modernism. And that's what I wanna try to say right now, is the same thing that was going on in modernism about you know, medium specificity is then transmitted into models of concepts in philosophy and in neuroscience. And that's going to be important for this idea of the brain without organs, which I'm going to make. Oh, shit. So the insistence on medium specificity arose in the era, and we're talking about art now, the insistence on medium specificity arose in the era of modernism and has become associated. Um, let's see if I can. Ooh. I wanted to see if I could do that. No, I can't. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, oh, I could, I could do it. Okay, the concept, however, can be tra traced back to Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, 1766 essay, The Laocoon. Lessing dismantles Horace's famous claim, Ut Pictura Poesis, as is painting, so is poetry, arguing that these media are inherently different because while poetry unfolds in time, painting exists in space. He refers to the medium as two equitable and friendly neighbors who should not overlap their re respective terrains. Lessing contends that an artwork in order to be successful needs to adhere to the specific stylistic properties of its own. Tracing Deleuze's idea of the body without organs and superimposing it upon the notion of the brain, one can say in fact that the brain without organs does, does not lack modules, hubs and verifiable cognates like we saw here, oh, shit. It doesn't, it doesn't lack these modules and, and cognates. Cognates is a, is a term used in neuroscience to mean um, a kind of an assemblage of certain neurons that work together to do something. Uh, it simply lacks the organism. That is a particular organization of organs. It's a brain without organs, right? It's, it's not under, it's, it's flexible, it's, it, it responds to, the, to this ex, extracranial brain. The brain without organs is indeterminate and neuroplasticity as its agency. We saw that already. We could also say that our neuroplastic potential is a form of common, a neural common, currently under assault by neoliberals' politics and its apparatuses, private and corporate ownership. And whenever I say something that seems so um, despondent and negative, 
I'm always aware of the positive uh, attributes of these things that that technology has made our life fantastic, but it has to be. I'm also very aware of its negative implications, and uh, I'm not a technophilic. I'm somebody who is more realistic about technology. But I, when I make these kind of grand statements, I don't want anybody to think that I'm totally against technology. I think it's amazing, but I do think we have to put reins on it. I think we have to rein it in. We have to, it has to go slower so that we can make the right decisions. And the reason I'm also giving these lectures to art students and, and, um, and, 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 and people in literature and all the different kinds of groups that I give lectures to is to kind of spread knowledge and, and make people conscious of what the implications are for these new technologies and to give them the vocabulary with which to be able to read about it in the newspaper. And when something, when there's, when the, uh, a positive neuroscientist wants to take over the literature department and do neuro literature or some bullshit like that, I want them to have, uh, I want them to have this activist position. I want them to understand the power of art and that art, that art creates um, it, it also investigates the same disciplines as neuroscience does, but comes up with different facts, different paradigms. And these paradigms are incredibly important to, to, the, to, to make us human. And like in the first, uh, that slide I showed you of the um, Par Parthenon marbles, I was using an activist neuroaesthetic approach to, uh, to talk about something uh, that for whatever reason, uh, science seems to be overtaking these discussions. So it's very important for me to raise consciousness about these things. I hope you understand that. Uh, but I'm not always so critical. I just don't want you to think I'm super critical. I am critical, but it's more about consciousness raising than it is to say everything in technology is bad, because obviously it's not. We have some amazing things. So here's the worldwide map right now of, uh, of the world, uh, the worldwide map of 24 hour relative utilization of the web. This is from 2012. And here is the new way uh, that the brain now is, is, for, is, is seen. And we see that it's a network brain. This is the brain without organs. The, that technology that not only has changed the way that people understand and consider the brain from this modular, uh, modular uh, modernist me uh, understanding where all the different parts of the brain do different things and they work as a, 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 as a kind of machine where each part of the brain has its different function to a nonlinear um, emerging network brain that is entangled with our new network society in which all parts of the brain are to a lesser or greater degree participating in all activities uh, of the brain. And of course, this, this diagram may change. 20 years ago, this may look as antiquated as the modular idea of the brain. We don't know, we'll, we'll see what, what's, to, what's to come. Either way, the development of brain networks does not involve brain processes alone. Neural mechanisms for learning and plasticity allow for the developing brain to extract emerging statistical regularities presented in the environment. I want to suggest that aleatory and chance experiments in the aesthetic cultural field alter distributions of sensibility and thus pre present altered statistical re regularities that organize the neural architecture differently. So artistic examples of, oh, I wanted to see Oh, by the way, um, I wanted to play, before we go on, I wanted to play um, that, one, that first video. Okay, so I have to get off sharing. Hold on. I have to get off sharing. Okay. Um, I have to, let's see. I have to turn off, stop presenting. And then, Pavel, you're going to show a video of mine, right? Pavel? Yes. Yes, you're of course. Show, yes, you're going to show the first video, the Parthenon uh, Marvels video. Okay. Because before I go on, I want to show that. So what this is is I can't do anything. So I can't change it. But anyway, if you, this is this is a um, a rendering that I made 
concerning neural uh, artificial neural networks. And these are what you're seeing here is a girl, a woman, excuse me, sorry about that, a woman who has a uh, new, it's a new virtual reality brain computer interface uh, device that is now becoming, you can now have. And what you're doing here is you're looking through her device at the, at this artificial neural network created. And the artificial neural network is operating by digital information, here it goes, digital information that it gets from what, what that woman is paying attention to. So depending on what she's paying, she's paying attention to, the digit data then goes into the algorithm that then changes the sculpture. So this sculpture, it's changing with time and it's changing with time and these different degree this represents another person this represents another person so we're seeing just like in the, the same situation that we saw with the cat uh we're seeing in 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 real time with a individual using these new virtual reality brain computer interfaces that are linked to the internet and are being used to do a kind of sculpting and, and artistic labor. Okay, turn on again. Okay. Okay, my entire screen. Yes, yes, no. Okay. I hope it works. Should work. Let me know when it's working. Is it on? Is my work on again? Hello, is my yes. screen on? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now we're going to talk about uh, aleatory and chance artworks and uh, in relationship, the kinds of artworks that uh, we're talking about. Um, in, and, and, and I should mention also that uh, so much of situationism and uh, the architectural space um, that they, they created was also based on chance meetings, like the psychogeography, walking through um, abandoned, um, abandoned courtyards, abandoned fields, taking alternative, uh, taking alternative streets, you know, um, deterritorializing different kinds of map systems upon each other, all the different uh, apparatuses of, of situationism. Is is are, are, are very much about creating uh, chance uh, chance meetings and different kinds of new relationships to uh, an environment to it desires to estrange uh, the urban uh, fabric, but in this case I want to talk about artworks um, you know more more uh, you know not such large uh, things. So uh, first artwork I want to talk about. Is to understand this idea of how this indeterminacy gets into the cultural milieu, gets into, because, you know, you've got to understand that just as we were looking at the relationship of modernism, postmodernism, basically that's what those, you know, the postmodern, the modernist idea of the brain and the postmodernist idea, the postmodernist idea that leads to this network idea uh, and, and then it creates the network um, brain. The idea is that it's it's it, that that different kinds of specificity, different kinds of medium, are porous. When we get into the 1960s, and you get into uh, Andy Warhol, uh, you know, making his silkscreen paintings based on photography, or we get into um, uh, you know different uh, artists from uh, like. Uh, uh, Rauschenberg, uh, his sculptures, his paintings that became sculpture. This is a kind of inkling, a beginning of the way that these different mediums will share information about each other and how mediums become porous. They become, it's not just about one medium, it's about the way that 
mediums uh, interact and communicate to each other. Sculpture in the expanded field. Um, the way that the earthworks become, they get out of the gallery, they find, try to find new locations, they and try to create new kinds of experiences for the, for the viewer. All of these things are indications of this kind of poricity. And that's what I'm arguing here also, is that this work that is about, uh, you know, uh, about this indeterminacy, that indeterminacy which before would be, was noise and would become something that you would want to um, uh, refuse or something that you would try to normalize or something that you would try to keep away from your system now is embraced as a way of estranging and making uh, and redistributing sensibility which allows uh, this this brain, this indeterminate neuroplasticity that we saw with the 17 day old cat with that assemblage of all kinds of possibilities, all, this, all the neurons with all kinds of possibilities that allow different kinds of environments to, to sculpt it. So to here, we understand this idea of indeterminacy. So let's, uh, we, we always have to go back to the, the grand master of the 20th century, uh, Marcel Duchamp. And um, let me see what happened here. Okay. Okay. Stop presenting. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. I've lost it again. Oh, here it is. Uh, to make three standard stoppages, Marcel, uh, Pablo, I think you need to turn off your microphone. Somebody out there has got their microphones on. Yeah? It's not my micro microphone. Oh, who is it? Well, somebody does. Anyway, to make three standard stoppages, Marcel Duchamp dropped three one meter long threads from the height of one meter onto three canvas strips. The threads were then adhered to the canvases, preserving the random curves they had assumed upon landing. Cut along the profiles of each fallen thread, the canvases served as templates for three draftsman straight edges, wood tools that retained the lengths of a meter but paradoxically standardized the accidental curve. Duchamp deliberately useless toolkit subvert standardized units of measure while simultaneously poking fun at the scientific method. This is an ultimate pataphysical, uh, pataphysical experiment. And pataphysics is a key element in activist neuroaesthetics, but it finds its, its playfulness in relationship to science here in the beginning with Duchamp. Though he glibly referred to three standard stoppages as a joke about the meter, his description of its outcome reads like a mathematical theorem. If a straight horizontal thread one meter long falls from a height of one meter into a horizontal plane twisting as it pleases, it creates a new image of the unit of length. If you're talking about disrupting sensibility and the way that we, that we make and understand, the, for instance, the urban environment, what better way than to disrupt the one what a meter is, and here is the here are, here here is the work. And Jean Arp Duchamp is not the only one experimenting with chance. Arp composed collages by picking up chance scraps of paper, shuffling them and gluing them down just as they fell. Examples: the squares arranged according to the laws of chance. Collage 1916. According to Hans Richter. Uh, according to him, he finally tore it up and let the pieces flutter to the floor to a studio. Sometime later, he happened to notice these same scraps of paper as they lay on the floor and was struck by the pattern they formed. It had all expressive power that he had tried in vain to achieve. How meaningful, how telling. Chance movements of this hand and the fluttering scraps of paper had achieved what all his efforts had failed to achieve, namely expression. He accepted this challenge from chance as a decision of fate and carefully pasted the scraps down in the pattern which Chance had determined. And here's the work. Tristan Sara composed poems by drawing words from a hat. Uh, to make a Dada's poem, to make a newspaper, take a pair of scissors, choose an article as long as you are Chance imagery George Brecht planning to make a poem. Cut out the article, then cut out each of the words that make up this article and put them in a bag, shake them gently, then take out the scraps one after another in the order in which they left the bag, copy conscientiously. The poem will be like you. And here you are, a writer, infinitely original, endowed with a sensibility that is charming through beyond the understanding of the vulgar. 
So here we are. And 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 this is you know we, um, I did uh, with three, four other, five other curators in New York uh, in 2011. I did a work that you can all look up. It's called Exhibition 211. And Exhibition 211 was a gallery that we, we uh, that was Matthew Copeland, Jacob Sussinger, Elena Bajo, Natalie Anglez, and Eric Anglez. We were the, the founders of this gallery. And basically artists came, uh, the gallery was divided up into six parts and we had a, we had a black hat, uh, like the hat that's described here. And in that hat, we had, uh, we had um, uh, different kinds of um, the names of the artists that we were thinking of working with and that we would uh, we would draw their names out of the hat and then we would invite the artist to roll the dice and depending on the roll of their dice they would occupy different aspects of the gallery and it was a long complicated program but you can look at it at 211 uh, ex exposition ex exhibition uh, in New York okay and see what that's all about but anyway I've used these things and then uh, Nikki St. Saval, Shooting Picture is one of a series of works by Nikki St. Saval, Tilted Tears, meaning fire or gunshot in French, which were made up until 1970 and all involved the artist shooting at the canvas. These shootings were conceived as performances and as such formed part of the work. At some, at some shootings, audience members were invited to participate. And in the case of this painting owned by Tate, the American artist Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns both took aim. and George Breck chance paintings. Chance paintings were created by bunching in soaked marbles up in a bed sheets in different formations, allowing the process to stain the sheets. And here's drip music, a, a drip, drip event by George Brecht. Drip music is Brecht's most famous. Fluxus and Fluxus inspired events over the years. The indeterminate score allows for a strong degree of freedom in performance through most interpretations of piece involved the performer dripping water from one vessel into another. In 1963, performance of drip music at Fluxus for, Flux Forum Fluxus in Dusseldorf, uh, George uh, Massinius performed this action from top of a ladder. So, aleatory music is a music which some element of the composition is left to chance, or some primary element of a composed work's realization is left to the determination of its performers. The term is most often associated with procedures in which the chance element involves a relatively no limited number of possibilities. Uh, some writers do not make distinction between aleatory and chance and indeterminacy in music and use the term interchangeably. From this point of view, indeterminate or chance music can be divided into three groups. The use of random procedures to produce a determinate fixed score, mobile form, and indeterminate notation, including graphic notations and text. The first group includes scores in which the chance element is involved only in the process of composition so that every parameter is fixed before their performance. In John Cage's music of changes, for example, the composer selected duration, tempo, and dynamics by use of I Ching, an ancient Chinese book which prescribes the methods for arriving at random numbers. Because this work is absolutely fixed from performance to performance, Cage re regarded it as an entirely determinate work made by using chance procedures. On the level of detail, uh, Ioannis Zanekis used probability theories to divine some microscopic aspects of pithoprakutka, which in Greek means actions by means of probability. This work contains four sections characterized by textural and tem temporal uh, attributes. Uh, so in um, 2017, I uh, was creating this work for the Venice Biennale which was called uh, the Pizzagate Neon. And I don't, you can all find that online. Uh, maybe I even gave that as a reading or a picture to you all to look at. And I was making, so I, I'm, I'm obviously very interested in this kind of indeterminacy and aleatory music and sound installation and scores. So I, I was, of course, I wanted to make, my idea was that these, these devices had to escape the, the artistic field. They had to become political uh, apparatuses, political uh, tools. So what I basically did in this piece was I made a score um, based on every time Donald Trump used the word fake news. So I went through the internet and uh, took the quotes uh, from Donald Trump in which he had used the word fake news and, and I cut them up 
um, and I put them uh, in a bag. I, I found 196, I believe. At that particular time, in 217, there was only 196. So I found 196, cut them out, cut them into pieces, put them in a plastic bag, mixed them all up, because now the, each one of the sentences was, so I win the election easily, a great movement is verified, and crooked components try to belittle our victory of fake news, a starry state. So I would cut up all the words, and it wouldn't be the sentence anymore, it would be cut up, it would be all the words cut up individually. Then I put them in a bag, and shook them up and then threw them uh, in the air and they fell on the floor randomly and then I picked them up randomly and constructed sentences that I put on to music scores. And then that's how this whole project began. And here are some of those, uh, those early works. And here's some more and those are, this is, uh, the, this is the way those pieces, they were kind of drawings. And these are the different, um, different parts of, of the expressions. Okay, and then we can play now. Let's play uh, scoring the tweet first, please. And while that's going on, stop. Okay, please stop sharing the screen. I, I did. I think I did. Okay. Um, I know, you know, I, I have been uh, exposed. I've been to many exhibitions on uh, Polish art. And I know that Pol Polish artists during the 70s were very involved in, hold it off for one second, because I want to ask a question. We're very involved in fluxus and conceptual art. So is anybody out there can can talk about some of the, before we go on, can talk about some artists in Poland or in your experience in the Eastern Europe that were very involved in this kind of indeterminacy? Maybe we could, before I show my piece, we could talk a little bit about that. Does anybody have any, you want to add something? Dominic, start off, start it off. Or maybe Drew, Drew, you're an encyclopedia. I think, think Jaroslav Kozłowski is the key figure in terms of that uh, involvement uh, okay. with the Fluxus uh, the movement. Okay. That's very, very important uh, artist for, I mean, speaking of that, that uh, area. Based in Poznań, anyway, so. <laughs> very good. And it's, uh, just, it's just, uh, just, just a shame we cannot have him around us, but maybe maybe within a more um, real situation, so you, you could visit Poznań and then we have a chance to for direct contact. That would be fabulous, that fabulous. And, um, okay, does anybody have any comments about? Okay, so I'll just go on. Let's play the video, please. Honesty, <laughs> dishonesty, 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 dishonesty. Want America stronger <laughs> than ever?
let's let's start questions. Anybody have any questions about what I said, or anybody want to talk about anything I said, or whatever? Any questions? Because the videos aren't working, but you can go find them. They're on the internet. They're all over the place. You know. Or was it just I overwhelmed and, and you're exhausted now from listening to me? <laughs> I had written about uh, three standard stoppages in a slightly different context because, in my view, all of abstract expressionism that came out of New York is aleatory. And the main point of it, which gradually drifted to uh, informel in Europe is that it's precisely a tension between chance and intention. It's most obvious with Pollock because of the, the drip, which are extremely difficult to control with precision. But it's even the case in, with painters you wouldn't expect, like Barnett Newman, because Barnett Newman combines two elements of chance. One is that his uh, monochromatic fields are full of chance because he always adds a second layer of color before the, f the preceding layer is dry. So you cannot tell how it's going to come out until after the fact. Mm. And the zip also is another layer of chance because you cannot tell the sort of line or the shape of it that will be left on the canvas when the masking tape that forms the zip is and even Rothko, he uses far too much turpentine to mix the paint. And the result is, if you ever look at the back of a Rothko, which I've had the honor to do, you see that the turpentine burns through to the back of the canvas and leaves a burn pattern, which is very unpredictable and, and chance, and which also changes completely the perception of light on the uh, front of the canvas that you're expected to see. So all of these painters, now in, in the case of England, you start to get a, a further effort to synthesize this intention with, with chance. In a Bacon, the, uh, the lines that he draws on most of his canvases to frame the kind of um, artificial perspective that he's created for the figure, these are very deliberate. But then when it comes to the figure, you get a smudge. He always uses a rag to, uh, or a sponge to just smudge, and you cannot tell what the result will be except ex post facto. And so this idea, I think it's not an accident that Dujon chose this moment, I think it was 54, uh, to, to make three standard stoppages right at the absolute heyday of abstract expressionism in New York. And in a way, as he always does, to joke, to make a joke of this um, very um, chance-oriented way of making art. Mm. The other thing I'd like to mention, if I may, is that earlier you made one very brief allusion to phantom limbs. Right. And this reminded me of the great moment that I had in your studio in, uh, in California when I was able to see your phantom limbs pieces. And I was hoping that you might uh, mention something about these because I thought they had a strong uh, relation to the um, neuroplasticity theme that you, you began with. Yeah, yeah I was, I mean, um, yeah. I, I have a whole set of slides about phantom limbs, um, but I just thought that, you know, I mean, I was, you know, I'm always afraid to uh, to talk about too much science. I mean, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I want to have, I want to be, um, uh, I want to be um, kind of uh, engaging, but also at the time uh, allowing people to come into what I'm talking about. And I find that sometimes, yeah, so I did leave all that stuff out about the phantom, but I did have, in, in the new work, um, phantom limbs are an important part of I me. Mean, it's kind of funny because I was look. I'm always looking, I'm always, there's, if, if somebody should, I'm not an art historian, but somebody should write an art, histor art history 
about the missing limbs in Greek sculpture because they're so preponderant and even like in in the lacoon, for instance, in the great sculpture, the great um, Greek sculpture that was uncovered in Italy in the in the 1500s, the lacoon uh, with the, the large the father and the sons next to each other, um, there were almost a hundred years of discussion about the proper way that those arms that had had lost had been lost in time could be reassembled and there were t it was it went all the way up to the papal court uh how the you know what was the proper um uh what was the proper way that the arm that was missing how had it been really uh, uh you know how, how had it been formed what was it like sculpturally and it's this idea of this lack this this history of the lack that is the basis of the Enlightenment and the basis of Western civilization, Western art, as it comes out of the Greek. Um, I think it's very important today in our post-colonial moment um, in which, um, you know, we are for the first time uh, embracing artists from the global south, for instance, because I think that this idea of the phantom, this phantom limb, this phantom uh, that, that has been left out and has been considered noise and has never been considered you know relevant is 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 a metaphor uh for um you know this kind of idea of a global enlightenment you know what i mean so i think you know and the way that those arms they the way they get broken their chance and then and then they sprout these phantom limbs in my mind i mean i'm i'm you know, it's very funny, and if you, if you come and see the sculpture in Berlin, and I hope you will, um, you'll see that uh, they're really deformed, and yet they contribute to the neural network, to the artificial neural network, in in, in establishing the artificial intelligence, which leads to this future singularity. You know, so I'm trying to um, use the phantom in a very different way. Of course, the phantom. The phantom limb is about remapping in the brain. There's a, a very, very important aspect of phantom limbs in which this phantom limb becomes remapped. In other words, what that means, and you can see it on the sculpture, even on the sculpture, is that a, a missing hand becomes remapped on the face, which means that even though the arm is not there, the hand is not there, you can touch with a Q-tip or a cotton swab different parts of the face on the side of the, on the same side of the, as the arm that's missing. And you can create the illusion of the phantom limb. So mm -hmm. there are certain part on the face which you touch and you feel your thumb. The thumb's not there, but you feel your thumb. And it has a lot to do with remapping where, because in the, in the, in the somatosensory cortex, the part of your brain, in the, kind of in the middle here, there's a whole ridge and the whole body, the whole skin surface, the sensory skin surface, is represented there, it turns out that the hand and the mouth and the face are right next to each other. So this idea of remapping happens in such a way that the area that is now missing can no longer stimulate its part in the cortex, and the cortex, the visual, the uh, somatosensory cortex for the hand, for the face, which is right next to the hand, takes over for the hand. And that's called remapping. But then you, then that becomes a metaphor for, um, the remapping of, 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 of Poland. My great, my great grandfather um, was from um, a portion of Poland, uh, a portion of Germany um, that is now Poland. So the, the, through the history of the relationship between Germany and Poland, there has been this incredible remapping or re-territorialization. But it becomes also a metaphor for phantoms, like phantom cultures how how the german the past prussian which was part of prussia how the past prussian uh empire uh how it still has phantoms that affect the cultural density uh, of the present day pol cultural uh, polish culture for instance so these there's different metaphors for this phantom some of them are neurobiological they they are situationist but they are also uh political Well, that's uh, 
That's that's incredibly interesting, Warren. But especially that I mean, with your with your allusion to Poland as such, me, which is according to very interesting book of Janek Koza, Fantomowe uh, Ciało um, Króla, the phantomatic uh, body of the king. The Poland in its own history is is in fact a phantomatic country. Uh, and there is a phantomatic pain also, uh, which is the pain of a missing, right? We did not exist for a certain amount of history. So I think this really appeals, that, that metaphor. But speaking of this metaphor, I would very much like to ask you about one thing which I very much um, find the, uh, incredibly um, exciting in terms of your investigation, in terms of art, but also in terms of the analysis of art, uh, uh, as a as a particular f function that it plays in, in terms of the uh, uh, the activity of the brain and, and its output, and and what what I what I would uh, like to ask you about that is that would you also consider art as such activity which you could could consider as prosthetical? Uh, how so? What do you mean by prosthetical? Prosthetical meaning that that you are dealing with the, with the the necessary link between what what's all already um, molded in terms of the brain and the and the the situation when you um, have the solution to actually get out of it. Oh, absolutely. The guy who is amazing, who writes amazing about this. I mean, is the uh, French uh, archaeologist anthropologist Le Roi Goron who is, uh, Stiegler plays, a, you know, uh, Stiegler is very indebted to. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he's talking about tools, the way that tools become part, become embedded in the brain. Uh, and also this guy named uh, Lambros Maliforis at, King, at Oxford. He's written a lot of really interesting ways that how art, like the my, he writes about the Mycenaean beads, and uh, he writes about them and how they become incorporated in in you know i can send you some articles that are fascinating exactly like that but what's what's also part of your question you know that's the direct answer to your question and i can send you some examples of that but um you know like for instance also the blind man stick the blind man stick is a perfect example of of an extended apparatus that exists both inside the brain and outside the brain it's 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 a, a prosthetic but it's a prosthetic that's that's inanimate but that is generating information that that is as real as if your own your own uh, physical system was being used as part of your body, right? So that's what he's talking about, about the forest. But I think also what you, what's fascinating about your question, and I think you're alluding to something which I was trying to talk about, and that is that if you look at the cat and you the cat in environment, the cat. Its neuroplasticity is 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 there, but it's it's not it's not creating objects that are disrupting or changing its environment like human culture does. Human culture, what it's doing, what the neuroplasticity and the um, the this uh, you know this inadvertent potential of of, of uh, indeterminacy is doing is the brain is always ready for new things. The indeterminacy of the brain is linked to the capacity of art to change the, the, the cultural environment in unknown ways. Mm. That is to say, um, for instance, you see so much in music today, um, and my brain is I'm in the middle of, you know, I, I, I can't remember uh, this uh, noise group from the um, gristle, something gristle. What's the throbbing. What? throbbing gristle. Throbbing gristle. How much throbbing gristle is dependent on indeterminacy and the uh, and the sound experiments of the uh, of the fluxus artist, for instance. You know how it how it not only generates through time, but also becomes part of that sensibility. It becomes embedded in the sensibility. Think of surrealism. Surrealism is another perfect example. Um, it, it, it links itself to psychoanalysis. It links itself to the theory of, of, of the dream. 
it, 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 it links itself to sleepwalking. It generates a whole vocabulary, an artistic uh, language, that then goes out onto in the in the small painting studio. But then all of a sudden, it appears on the department in the department store advertisements and fiches that populate uh, the urban environment. And gradually, it it through its it it, it generates it generates and disrupts. The, dis the distributions of sen sensibility. I think that's happening today with post-colonial art and feminist art as well. I think that the power of these art forms is their disruption of the cultural milieu and the brain and the mind, because the brain and the mind are connected, the brain and the mind's flexibility and plasticity because of its incredible indeterminacy of the neural plasticity, to be able to engage with it and to bring it into its, its mode of functioning. Mm. Well, I think uh, well, well, I, I think the disruption is is a very key word here, and uh, I have to admit that that uh, reading your 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 uh, really um, uh, um, impressive texts in in this book, uh, uh, the brain without organs, uh, ayahuasca, and the theory of the nature of regression, I couldn't stop thinking. <laughs> of the the book uh, uh, of, of a prophet, I would say, who was Philip K. Dick, mm -hmm. and the book is called "Let uh, Let the uh, Let the Tears Flow." A policeman said, and to those who didn't read the book, there is this: the the, the basically the plot is that the, the, the I think is very prophetic that you have the. Uh, the man who is a celebrity and basically suddenly somebody erases um, all of his data from the central computer and nobody can recognize him anymore. He becomes yeah. invisible and the only way to go back is to uh, uh, find a certain drug, certain psychedelic drug. And when using this drug, the whole the whole uh, phenomenal idea, and I think s somehow it applies to 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 the way how yeah. you um, perceive our activity uh, at the time of of cognitive capitalism, is that the actual drug does not affect you, but it affects the reality. So by using the drug, you are able to change to reshape the environment. So finally, he's able to be back on track, and he's recognized again. <laughs> by the society, but, but by using this drug. So by applying this drug onto his brain, in fact, he affects what's around him in a very direct physical way. And that kind of reference, I would also apply to the, to the, to the nature of art, as I could imagine you could see the, the, the function of it in the negotiation between the, um, the brain and and uh, our uh, the molding of of the uh, of the algorithm which we are going through at the moment. Uh, well, I like I like I like that analogy, and, and the thing about it is is that I would say that the art is indeterminate. I mean, and we and, and we want to keep that indeterminacy because with all of this neuroplasticity and all of this epigenesis and all these new theories and blah blah blah, there is the uh, the possibility of 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 an incredibly repressive uh, neuro neuro material uh, despotism that could occur, and we have to be very aware of it. And I just wrote a paper uh, for the University of um, Zurich, um, and in that paper, it's all about brain computer interfaces. And I'm kind of projecting, you know, right now, brain computer interfaces are used just basically to help uh, people who are paraplegic who are situated in wheelchairs to use their brain waves to you know move a wheelchair around move a robotic arm and then of course already but it's already being used for video games and such and um there's a very uh, interesting book that i basically I, I would suggest read chapter two it's going to be part of the new book that i'm coming out with um called activist neuroaesthetics readings and Act activist neuroaesthetics which will be coming out very soon and it's, it's Slavador, Slavaj Zizek has written a book called The Wired Brain and Hegel. Hegel and the Wired Brain. And in chapter two, I suggest everybody read the book. Uh, it's quite, it's quite uh, amazing, <laughs> to be honest with you. And he really knows what's going on. Because I, I really, when I read it, he knows what's, what he's talking about. It's not bullshit. I mean, he really understands the possibilities of this despotic 
neural-based state. And um, I, I suggest everyone read that book, or just the second section. I can even, I have the second chapter um, because I'm using it in this new book that's coming out on reading. So I could send it to you if you're interested. But I would suggest you take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I, it was a lot. But I thank you for putting up with me. Uh, and I really appreciate, uh, you know, the care, for, the care you took in listening to my work and the question. And you would like to ask about, or oh, am I right, Srijan? Oh, somebody wants to write another question. Hi, Srijan. You need to switch on on the microphone. <laughs> Again, the microphone. You yes. have to, there you go. Okay, there you got go. it. There you go. Sorry, uh, Warren. Thank you Hi. so much. This is making my day, and uh, especially your artwork and research and graphics. And uh, <clears throat> I have two two curiosities. Uh, one is, <clears throat> yes, the art of the seventies has provided disruption, as Dominic says, but hasn't it also provided comfort? a certain comfort that this is possible you know it was not possible before and i'm entering in this is not an advertisement i'm entering to a new project on comfort uh in, in berlin with the berlin and we're going to work with vr uh in fact so yeah i was very fascinated if i can find that video that you made i can send it to you it's not online or anything like that uh, yet all right if you, you, if you don't send it around and keep it to yourself i'm happy to send yeah. it to you <laughs> The second thing is that that I was also that's my curiosity. I want to know what you think about this, you know, this notion of comfort, you know, human comfort, right? You know, especially today with all of this Zoom, Google views, WebEx, whatever, you know, we see each other people, we see each other in personal spaces. And as an architect, you know, I notice details. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> there are some, you know, people close the cameras when they don't want to be intimate, but there is something quite comfortable about that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and there is a comfort in, in a distance, a remoteness. And so, <clears throat> so that's my curiosity, number one. Uh, number okay. two. You want me to answer number one first, and then we yeah, can do, do it. Yeah, I think I forgot the number two. But <laughs> well, you know what's what's interesting about what you're saying is that I think it has to do with something else that's happening. Um, in you know, we are in the face right now of a kind of digitality that was pre-pandemic. I mean, there were certain elements of this digitality that were involved, right. in, whether it's using Zoom teaching on Zoom, whether it's buying food off the internet, whether it's um, financial banking online, all these different things. But of course, during the pandemic, it's become extensu ex extended. Uh, even, even my own ambivalence to technology, I must say I have an ambivalence. I mean, every time I hear about Elon Musk and his driverless cars, it really freaks me out because there's a lot of human beings, a lot of truck drivers, taxi cab drivers, and so forth, who have made a very good living um, driving cars and, and their lives will be disrupted with driverless cars. On the other hand, now, because of all, before, before we knew how COVID was spread and we all worried about the touching and hands and all that other stuff, but, you know, it, we, we now are more sure it's more of a respiratory disease, but at one point we weren't so sure. The idea of a driverless car bringing my food that I ordered on the internet didn't sound so bad anymore, you know what I mean? And I think that a lot of us are taking more comfort in digitality. That's the first part of the answer. I have two, three answers for you. The first answer is the, basically our comfort with digitality. We're not feeling so, yeah. we're accepting it more now. <clears throat> so I would say the first thing is our comfort with digitality, yeah? The second thing wow. is, is that I think what hap what, what's really important to understand about digitality is those people who are who are creating these digital platforms and i'm referring to silicon valley 
in my own sphere of knowledge, I can talk about Silicon Valley, but I'm sure it's happening all over the world, in China especially, in other places. And that is this idea of the geek, G-E-E-K. Have you heard that expression before, a geek? Yeah. Well, geekiness is a kind, is, is, is a kind of uh, label that was given to the kind, uh, to, in your high school, to the kid who was doing the projections for, for the AV department <laughs> or, or who was first learning about computers, you know, uh, who was more, he was less emotional or she was less emotional. Um, they were um, um, a little bit, uh, you know, science, very interested in science and all those kinds of things. But their affect and their ability to feel, they were a little bit on the spectrum. They were a little bit on the spectrum. And my feeling of comfort is that we are evolving into a society of the spectrum. What I'm talking about is autism, the autist spectrum, which I, which I embrace in neural diversity. I think that, and this is the third part of the answer is about neural diverse. What is neural diverse and what is neural diversity? But the second part of the answer is the fact that I believe that these geeks are creating technologies to make themselves feel more comfortable in the world. <laughs> you like that, huh? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're creating these technologies to make themselves feel more at home and to be able to, to, to have the capacities. Now, the reason I say that is I'm a little bit of a geek. And I have, you know, I, I grew up when I, was in high, when I was in elementary school, I had severe ADD. I stuttered. I had a very bad stutter. I had to go to speech pathology lessons for five years. Plus, I had to, I had a walk. I had a problem walking. I had this thing called a, I had a, a, a duck, I was duck footed. I, I, my feet would go out. And for one year, my mother made me walk down a single plank of wood for one year. I had to do it like three or, three or four hours a day. I'm not kidding. And I've overcome all of those. I still have a little stutter. You don't see it, but I do sometimes. I'm still a little ADD, but the ADD has turned into something else called multitasking. But anyway, what happened is that all of those things, may, I was a geek, and it turns out that I have enjoyed Zooming a lot. I really, I've taken to Zooming. I love meeting people on Zoom. I love lecturing on Zoom. I love interacting with students. Some people, some of my professors, professional professors who work with me, they hate Zoom. They, they're dying to get back in the classroom. Me, I love it, you know? So I'm just saying that, you know, it, I think that these technologies are to make geeks like myself more comfortable, you know? <laughs> I, you know, and I think the third thing is, is that we're all, our brains are being sculpted. We are becoming, uh, we are becoming uh, internet, uh, it, well, you know, there used to be, a, there was a big separation because, be, between what's called internet natives and internet um, uh, immigrants and internet natives. We've heard all that. You know about that, right? Digital natives, digital immigrants. I think we're all becoming digital natives. Okay, um, thank you. I remember the second question. Okay. You did? Go ahead. <laughs> so I just, um, since I came in a bit late, uh, due to the visual cortex of my iMac that died. And uh, <laughs> so I had to improvise them down to the wire. And uh, But you mentioned architecture um, a couple of times, uh, maybe more like urban planning or urban design. I, I would like you to say a little bit more about that. It would really be helpful. Okay. Well, I don't know if you know this, but I have a book called Cognitive Architecture from Biopolitics to New Politics. I researched you. You've seen it? Yeah, I don't have the book, but I researched it. Oh, okay, good. And so um, I did that. I just give you a little bit of my kudos. I was, at, um, I was studying, I was a research fellow at Delft School of Architecture for four years. And um, that book was my, actually was the preparation for my PhD thesis, which I got too busy to do, you know, but I wish, I mean, I always wish I had done it, of course, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just was too busy and, but that was so much work. I figured I'd, I'd done it. You know, they should have given me the PhD for that book. Anyway, 
So what was interesting about that book for me was that um, I was really understanding for the first time what cognitive capitalism was. See, for me, architecture is not just simply the architecture of the city or the urban landscape or whatever. The architecture is the architecture of the internet. To me, and it, you know, there are many different kinds of architecture, and that was the point of the book. The point of the book was that architecture had become per performative. And that book was also kind of a reaction against, um, against um, uh, certain kinds of uh, digital architecture that was, um, was really becoming prevalent at that time, which I felt um, was called parametric architecture. So I, it was a reaction to parametric architecture. But what was interesting about parametric architecture was that it provided the bridge between my ideas of architecture as something that exists in the, in the landscape, in the city landscape, and something that was occurring in the internet of things and the World Wide Web and the structure of all these things. And how it was, it was in, and, and this is a little bit, I, I don't, I, I think it's a little hard to, to really describe what I'm trying to say right now uh, in few words. Uh, but if you're patient, I can explain that, um, that I developed this idea called epigenetic architecture, which came out of the idea of genetic architecture, where genetic architecture was using the DNA molecule as, a, 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 as an idea for coding architecture, where the, this parametric architecture would use a code and generate different forms, many, many different forms of architecture from the same, from the same basis, basic, um, uh, from the, 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 the same basic um, beginnings and would generate multiplicity of different forms. And you know that's how parametric architecture, if you've, you've used it, works. And I was saying that something else happened is when that architecture entered into uh, an environment, it was actually built and it became part of an environment that it then developed another level of, of interacting with the other buildings that it was involved it, it was in with that the building when the building was formed and it was transformed it went through another what, what i call um epigenetic architecture in which it, it it interacted in emerging ways far from equilibrium and that that was how it then sculpted the neuroplasticity of the architecture of the brain so there was this link between changing architecture and the way that architectural cities and spaces and voids were changing as a result, and how important this parametric architecture, how it was normalizing, normalizing certain aspects of that architectural environment, and then normalizing the brain. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, Donald. <laughs> no? Oh, okay. I see Cone Jeff Bisa is on the line. Yes. <laughs> oh, hello. So another fellow doctor. I mean, I studied medicine, right? You know that. I studied medicine. And yes. Cone is a is a medical doctor who went to the Whitney program. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he, he another hybrid. Yeah, go um, on. And it's Cohen? Because we, we have Cohen on our next lecture within the, 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 oh. the next week. Okay. Together with, with the conversation with Donald, what I, what I presume the, the, these are your plans for, for the next, uh, next meeting. <laughs> what are you going to talk about? Exactly. Uh, we're we're going to make it a surprise, but it's going to be, Donald, shall we reveal our, uh, <laughs> shall we pull the curtain back or not? <laughs> Maybe we'll keep you tantalized. Be my guest. <laughs> okay. All right. It's it's done with smoke and mirrors. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, Warren, I did have one question though. Oh, great, great. About um, synesthesia and creativity and how the brain is uh, structured in synesthesia. It might be a whole different you know lecture, but I was yeah. just curious if there's a short answer that uh, you have. Yes, of course. I mean, I mean, I don't. I'm not an expert. In, this is when it becomes you know. 
when a neuroscientist studying this could give you a better answer when you ask things like that. However, I do have enough knowledge about synesthesia and about neuroplasticity in the brain that I can give you somewhat of an answer. It turns out that even though, as I mentioned to you before, that we have a visual cortex and an auditory cortex, and we have all these kind of cortexes in the old modular idea, and that when we go to the cognate, non-distributed non, um, uh, network brain, you start seeing that these, these very, very strict determinations aren't so strict anymore. So of course, the tongue can see. And uh, there have been scientists who taught, have taught the tongue to see. And it turns out that if you take, there's, there's two uh, portions of the brain uh, that are called the, uh, the medial and lateral geniculate bodies. And the medial uh, geniculate body is, for, is connected to the auditory cortex and the lateral geniculate body, of course, is connected to the visual cortex. However, in a mongoose, there have been research experiments in which they took the optic nerve and put it into the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which goes into the auditory cortex and made the auditory cortex see. So there you go. There's so what I'm saying is that synesthesia is uh, the capacity of, of a kind of uh, plasticity and flexibility uh, of these different portions of the brain. They're not so structured. So, uh, you know, they, they, they have the capacity. The auditory co brain can see its capacity, has capacity to see, and the visual cortex has capacity to hear. So that's what I would say to your answer. Of course, yeah. Well, maybe we should be using the, the term the networked body because we know there are taste receptors in the lung and we know that the uh, the neural networks and the and the gut are yeah. also called the second brain, right? Right. So that's the body, body of that organs. That's the body of that. Organs. Yeah. Right. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, um, the 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 gut is is the second brain, especially through the vagus nerve, which goes directly to uh, you know. Anyway, I'm a little burned out right now. I kind of uh, I'm kind of. My brain is exhausted right now. But I will take one more question. <laughs> if somebody has one, otherwise, maybe we should wrap it up. Anybody out there? Alexandra Dunaj, Alba Marie Gomez Sanchez. Anybody else? Carolina Kubik. I no? can do if I may. Um, I really uh, appreciate <clears throat> you telling about the difference between chance and randomness. You know, I, I went, I, I come, I'm in New York now, but I come from former Yugoslavia and, and I went to one of these crazy socialist schools and I have a degree in mathematics at 18. Wow. And um, <clears throat> so we spoke about randomness. I just want it's a question you know we spoke about this difference the randomness is calculated you know we can make an algorithm uh, for randomness you know, to be very precise so what, what is your knowledge about that <clears throat> further knowledge or thinking uh, so you want it, what sorry i got lost your question is about randomness your view so of random. I think, about, I, think part of you. Uh, I, I, I don't, I'm, it's not something that I've thought about or it's not something that I've read any books about, to be honest with you, but just off the cuff, off the top of my head, okay? Yeah. I would say that chance can become ordered. A chance can become that, that between, that randomness, that chance is the intermediary between randomness and order and acts as a bridge. The chance can act as a chance uh, 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 that there. It, it's like a, 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 a Zen diagram. If you have three, if you if you think about it, with three circles that have this area of the midbelt, which they are, which are they share, right? But I would say in the middle of that diagram is the uh, is chance, and chance has certain it, it, chance allows uncertainty uh, to become uh, less sublime. 
less sublime. It gives it a language. It, allow, it translates it. Chance can translate uh, randomness. And that, through that translation, it, become, it can become part of a, a larger order. That's the only answer I can give you. What do you think about that? Thank yeah? you. Cool. Okay. You like that? OK. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody else? Alba, Marie, Gomez, Sanchez, come on. Ask me a question. <laughs> OK. Well, uh, it, it, it's all uh, l'esprit d'escalier, Warren. So you may expect uh, maybe questions. I will pass through my okay. students later Great on idea. for you. Great idea. Send me an email. Because we, at the moment, I guess we're overwhelmed by the amount of knowledge and uh, and your your uh, fantastic uh, input uh, that you gave us. Oh, thank you. So, Very thank nice. Thank you for the, thank you for this chance we had. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you for this chance. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Congratulations. Uh, spectacular works. Really, really oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I yeah. hope maybe you're going to be in Berlin to see. The new work, you know. Yeah. Uh huh. It'll be up for four months, I think. Suppose There's a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> Depends how COVID allows. Are you in travel. Hawaii? Are you in New York or Hawaii? Actually, I'm babysitting my grandkids in Arizona right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice, nice That's why we lost connections because <laughs> we we're fumbling here. <laughs> That's the reason for your blue screen, uh, Cohen. Yes, <laughs> and I kept it off as well. Yeah. <laughs> what town are you in? What town are you in? I'm in Gilbert, which is uh, you know you know where Gilbert is, uh, Queens no. Creek. It's out towards east. Yeah, it's southeast of Phoenix. Oh, cool. Southeast yeah. of Phoenix. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just one more thing, Warren. If you're in yeah. Berlin, <clears throat> I'll be there starting summer until the okay. end of the year. Come visit the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts. Okay. <clears throat> so love residents there and uh, great. Susan. We, 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 all, we all come. Yeah. Dominic, come to you. Dominic will give you my email. I'd love to come visit you there. It'd be a lot. Yeah, sure. Send it over. Over. We'll get together. <laughs> okay, that'll be nice. Let's have a dinner. Yeah. I'm, I'm vaccinated. Have you guys got vaccinated yet? I got number one, and I'm getting number two on uh, June 22nd. After that, I'll be a free man. Yeah, I still well, wear a mask. So they say. So they say. But <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that's how we shall see. We have to vaccinate the world before it's going to be taken. Before we're really going to be safe, the whole world has to be vaccinated because as long as it's around and and virulent, it can it can it can mutate, and you don't know what's going to happen when it mutates. It might mutate beyond. You know, so let's hope we vaccinate the whole world. That's why I was a little disappointed with Johnson and Johnson, because it would have been a one-shot deal. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. It could have been given to the whole world. You know. Anyway, let's not get into that. Okay, amazing. No. It's lunch, it's lunchtime here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your for your talk. Uh, Thank you. It's been great. Pleasure. And we, we hope we we see each other in this in this group uh, in the next two weeks time. With, okay, with I, 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 to be on. I want to see Cone. I definitely so yeah. I'll try to come. Okay, uh, you know if I'm not in the if I'm not on an airplane, I'd be in Berlin in the, the 25th. It, is it, when is your when is the lecture? 29th. Uh, 29th. Okay. Yeah, that'll be good because I'll be in one place, you know, with good internet and everything. Okay. 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 Well, you, can, you can always come by to my studio because we neighbors. So. <laughs> okay. That'd be great. Love it. Love it. I know we're we'll right to each other. I know. We'll have to have Malaysian food again. Remember that was our last meeting. That was good. That was good. Yes. Right. That was Malaysian good. food in Berlin, right? Well, there was another curator who came with you, but I know I've never seen her again. All right, I'm forgetting her name, but yes, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was nice. That was nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Nice to see you all. Nice to meet you. Good to see you again. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Are you. Drew, are you in Berlin still, or where are you? I am. I haven't moved. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll see you then soon. Bye bye. Good. See you soon. Bye. Thank you.
Nossa, não tem nossa, né?